So the Yuan Dynasty um, was founded by um, a non-Chinese speaking people, you know, coming from the north. Um, the period from the 10th century <coughs> to um, the 13th century in China, it was characterized by the constant uh, kind of conquest of China <coughs> by the nomadic people. You know, first, um, the Khitan who founded the Liao dynasty in the 10th century. And, um, you know, then the conquest of the entire North China um, the Yellow River area by the Jurchen, who founded the um, <coughs> excuse me, the Jin Dynasty, and finally um, the Mongols, you know, conquered uh, not only entire China but also half the world in the 13th century. So the beginning of the second millennium. Um, CE um, in Chinese history is characterized by the expanding influence of the nomads over the um, <coughs> settled <coughs> population of the Han Chinese. And um, you know the Mongols after they conquer um, the entire China in 1279, they were facing a dilemma that is, you know, a very small population, about one, only 1% one of the population <coughs> was ruling um, a majority of Han Chinese who, uh, you know, consist of 90% of the empire's population. So um, the, there's the strategy um, for governance <coughs> had to be adjusted, uh, you know, compared to both previous Chinese uh, regimes as well as the former um, method of governance um, in the, um, the Mongol territory. So one strategy, of course, was the um, location of the capital in Beijing. And uh, Beijing is um, located on the border area between <coughs> the settled life and the nomadic area. So Beijing is very close to the Great Wall, which was the um, traditional uh, demarcator um, between the two ways of life, the nomadic and the, um, the, the settled life of the farmers. So that was one strategy. <coughs> so the capital shifted to the northern, northern end of China proper. And the second <coughs> um, measure the Mongols adopted to cope with the situation of a minority elite ruling a majority, um, very kind of uh, powerful culture was to be open and tolerant, <clears throat> especially in terms of the practice of religion. So the Mongols sponsored all kind of religion. Um, they didn't, you know, set up a, you know, specific um, religion and uh, declare others, you know, um, illegal. 
So they basically, the Mongol rulers in Beijing um, sanctioned um, all religious practice. They adopted, for example, Confucianism in terms of government and uh, in terms of how um, the, the nation's talents were recruited um, to to the, the governance um, of the empire. They also sponsor the um, Taoism, which was a traditional Chinese religion, and as well as Buddhism, a religion, um, you know, introduced from, from India. <coughs> and they especially um, favored um, a non-Chinese branch of Buddhism, that is the, um, the Tantric tradition from Tibet. For example, uh, the Mongols, the uh, Mongol rulers, um, the, their personal um, religious association was Tibetan Buddhism. And, um, and that is probably a gesture um, to kind of balance the Chinese influence. And they also sponsored Islam. Um, so uh, they brought large population of Muslim from Central Asia and also, you know, from the um, Arabian Peninsula, you know, to China. And, you know, we, we discussed this phenomena um, in the introduction to the uh, um, Islamic architecture in China. So they were quite open. <coughs> and by, you know, mixing the religion and brought people of different religious background under, you know, the same office and the same station in the same city, they some, somehow created a melting pot for, you know, cultures to be um, kind of more interactive and um, also um, creating kind of hybrid uh, in terms of both religious practice and um, architectural, you know, construction. Um, Yuan Dynasty, although it lasted only about 90 years. Um, it, you know, left us many um, <clears throat> buildings, you know, much more compared to the Song Dynasty, uh, which was kind of longer, um, about 300 years, you know, ruling China for about 300 years. <clears throat> so that was quite remarkable. Um, so this building, you know, we are looking at um, a Taoist building, this Yongle Gong, um, the Yongle Gong Temple is a Taoist complex um, located in the in Shanxi province. <coughs> and uh, <coughs> the Taoist temple, um, the layout of Taoist temple was um, highly influenced by by Buddhist temple. Well, it sounds um, a little awkward because um, you know Buddhism was a religion in introduced to China from from India from outside, while Taoism was a you know original local Chinese religion. How come? Buddhism influenced Taoism. Well, the reality is Taoism, before Buddhism was introduced, um, was, a not, was not a well-organized -organ uh, religion. So it was a, a, a very loose association of belief system. <coughs> it was only after Buddhism was introduced. You know, Buddhism was very systematic, very institutionalized. It has a a system of monastery um, network. And um, 
the reality is, you know, Taoism um, as a organized religion was highly modeled after Buddhism. Um, so it was only after Buddhism <coughs> was introduced to China, Taoists started to compile their own classics, their own, um, you know, thought into a collection <coughs> uh, following the example of Buddhist Sutra. And uh, Taoist temple was also constructed pretty much uh, based on the model of, of Buddhist monastery. And of course, you know, Buddhist monastery was also modeled after um, residential, you know, palatial uh, residence um, in in the from the age of disunion. So, you know, in that case, they were both, you know, products of the same kind of architectural tradition that features courtyards and axiality. So, uh, Yongle Gong, the Yongle um, Taoist monastery, <coughs> was no um, exception. So, um, a courtyard start with um, a gate, which, of course, demonstrate a public face um, to, you know, to the <coughs> to the to the public sphere. And behind it, <coughs> a series of halls were dedicated to uh, different Taoist deities, just following the example of, of, of Buddhist mon monastery. Um, so today, um, <coughs> much of the additional courtyards that provide the living environment had been um, destroyed but the three major um, building dedicated to the Taoist uh, main deity um, had survived. Um, we have we have been talking about the uh, stylistic difference between northern and southern architecture since the Song Dynasty, and um, you know the Yongle Gong. Taoist monastery um, obviously belong to the northern tradition. The gate, for example, um, even though as a gate it it has a uh, large opening uh, in the middle, in the central three bays, uh, the side bays, um, you know, are very solid and um, and closed. So. <coughs> And in general, it has a characteristic of um, solemnness and um, you know heavy um, kind of style, featuring those um, thick and a totally enclosed wall. So start with the gate um, accessed uh, from a staircase, um, and the staircase um, also. Um, highlight the centrality and axiality um, of the building complex. So, <clears throat> located in the in the cen center of the courtyard um, is the most important um, building for the whole monastery. So, if you look at the, you know, take this as the um, the courtyard. Um, if you draw a cross, diagonal, um, diagonal line, you find that the um, most important building kind of located right here. This is called a San Qing Dian, um, the hall of the three purities. Um, <coughs> you know, following the example of Buddhism. Taoism also created its own kind of trinity of divinity. Uh, in Buddhism, 
there was the three major Buddhas, Buddha of the past, Buddha of the present, and the Buddha of the future, that were often uh, worshipped in the main Buddha hall um, in Chinese Buddhism uh, since the Song Dynasty. And um, <coughs> Taoist, Taoist priest um, copied that and created their three supreme gods, and they call them the three purities. Um, and that is um, in, in that building. <coughs> so here, I also wanted to draw your attention. Um, a similar layout can be found in the Forbidden City. Um, for the arrangement of the of three um, major halls uh, for the imperial palace, that is located in the uh, center of the of a courtyard. Um, for example, in the um, hall of supreme harmony complex in the Forbidden City, and the hall of supreme harmony is located in the very center and followed by two smaller buildings. Um, of the um, main palace courtyard. So here, this is before the 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 um, Ming Qing Dynasty Forbidden City, and in religious architecture we can see the same phenomena. Three major halls, and the most important building is located in the in the middle rather than in the back. <coughs> so this is. Um, similar to palatial architecture than to Buddhist architecture. So, um, <clears throat> you know, so far I have been emphasizing the influence of Buddhism on Taoism, but in terms of the main building arrangement, instead of putting the most important um, hall in the very back of the axis, it was located in the in the middle of the courtyard. So it features a kind of a more um, <coughs> Chinese tradition, um, especially uh, that can be observed in residential architecture. So the most important building is in the very front. It is occupying the central location, but located as the very first major um, worshipping hall uh, in a series of halls. Um, this is quite different from the, uh, the Buddhist layout. So uh, the Sanqing, Sanqing Dian, the Hall of Three Purity, <coughs> is the most important of the three. Um, it has a layout of seven by four base so seven bays on the south facing main facade and four bays on the east and the west. Um, <clears throat> it also has a um, a bracket that features three jumps and uh, that three jumps is also known as uh, six, six puzo. Um, so there is just a, another Chinese terminology um, describing the um, complexity of the of the bracket, right? So basically, you know, four puzo is 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 it's just one jump, and. Uh, um, five puzo is two jump, six puzo is is um, three jump. So it has, has three jumps. Um, it also features um, cupola in the interior, uh, the ceiling. And uh, <coughs> the walls and and the um, the doors um, also is characterized by its Kind of heavy and um, and more kind of seclusive um, appearance uh, appropriate for a northern style. 
and located on a um, high platform accessed through the central stair. So all those are quite, um, you know, typical uh, for um, the, the northern style Chinese architecture. So this is the uh, <clears throat> most important building in this Taoist temple. And, uh, you know, um, the one in the back called the Chunyang Dian, and this is you know, dedicated to the founder of this specific Taoist school. Um, <clears throat> and, um, you know, its uh, rank is lower than the Three Purity Hall. Um, that is quite obvious. For example, it has a layout of five by four bays. So the main facade um, has, has five bays instead of seven um, and also um, it has a five puzo or only two jumps uh, for the brackets and in the interior it has only one cupola while the three purities has three cupolas and um, the three purity hall also features a pure hip to roof and the um, the chenyang dian um, has a hip and gable roof. You know, there's a vertical wall and then the hip to roof. So, <clears throat> so from now on, you should be um, good at you know comparing those different ranks by looking at these um, architectural features. So the the Chenyang Dian is obviously one rank um, lower than the Sanqing Sanqing Dian. Uh, <clears throat> now that is um, that is the uh, kind of a synchronous uh, comparison of buildings in terms of their hierarchy. Now, um, if we take another comparison. Um, a kind of a diachronic uh, comparison comparing the Yonglo Gong Sanqing Dian with an earlier building, uh, we, we would be able to notice the kind of historical development of Chinese wooden structure. And we are comparing, for example, here on the top, uh, we have the, the Yonglo Gong, right? And at the bottom, so you guys should be able to recognize it. Um, that is the the Fu Guang Si, um, the the Tang Dynasty structure from the ninth century. So in this case, their ranks are similar. Both Yong Le Gong and Fu Guang Fu Guang Si uh, halls are seven bay structure. Now, both of them have seven bays and they also both have a pure hip to roof and both uh, featuring a northern style um, that has the central five bays opening as doors and then the side bays pretty much closed up and both allocate uh, elevated on a platform. So, <clears throat> um, in fact, both of them have three jumps uh, in terms of their bracket dogong, and both feature this kind of a um, dragon head and a fish tail combination um, on the to decorate the end of the ridge. So that is. Pretty similar too. A major difference <coughs> is the proportion of the building and the height of the roof. Right? You know, Tang architecture is much more horizontal. And the Yuan architecture became more vertical. Right? So in terms of proportion. 
the Tang Dynasty has a proportion of a elongated rectangle, while the Yuan building is the vertical dimension is much more uh, extended. So they have very different proportion. Um, <clears throat> the roof for Yong Lo Gong is also taller than the roof of the uh, the Fo Guang Si. The slope is much uh, steeper. Look at that slope and this slope. So <clears throat> that's a general kind of stylistic change from the you know early wooden structure to later uh, traditional wooden structure, uh, the proportion, and also the um, the roof height was was much more stretched. One of the major reason for that is um, before Tang Dynasty, uh, in the Han Dynasty, for, for example, the Chinese, like today's Japanese, they um, do not use chair. They use the floor directly. Um, they sit on the floor instead of sit on those high chairs. But during the age of disunion, and especially during the Tang Dynasty, gradually a new habit was formed to use high chair in the interior. And the Tang Dynasty was a transition. So in Tang Dynasty architecture, we find uh, the building height, um, the interior was still kind of pretty low. Following the previous convention of, you know, living directly on floor, even though um, some chairs were already being adopted um, since the, the Tang Dynasty. But after the Song Dynasty, you know, during the Song Dynasty, the use of chair and high, um, you know, table and a bed was fully established. So in general, starting with the Song Dynasty, the interior of Chinese architecture became much taller because the convention of not uh, living on floor was fully established. And that was a lifestyle, um, of course, influenced by the northern nomadic cultures, you know, traditional Chinese way, like contemporary Japanese was living on floor, um, just sitting on floor directly. If you if you look at the historical record from the Confucian classics from the Zhou dynasty, they all talk about people sitting on the floor. Um, all those all all those ritual system were kind of depicting activity that not using chair at all. Um, chair was kind of unknown. So that contributed to that proportional change. <clears throat> and you can see the proportion of the Tang Dynasty Bay is like that. And this Yuan Dynasty building it's like that, right? So that proportion is, is quite different. The adoption of chair um, in the interior require higher ceiling. Um, and um, that changed the proportion of Chinese architecture. And uh, <clears throat> the rising and tilting up of the roof um, might or might not have something to do with that change, but that is a, 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 a phenomena, a fact that the, the, the height of the roof was also um, raised and uh, the slope 
of the roof became kind of steeper. Um, this is the, you know, th these are the interior <coughs> um, of the Sanqing um, Hall, the Three Purity Building, and uh, the the cupola um, that decorate the interior. So these cupola like this, as well as the ornate decoration um, and the elaborate kind of brackets featuring six puzo or three jumps and these were all features of imperial architecture right so the yongle gong monastery was sponsored by the imperial court so it was it, it was a high rank building that were allowed to use such um ornate decoration and using the cupola uh, which were also a feature of imperial architecture. Usually, it is located in the throne, um, the throne room of a imperial palace um, that adopt this kind of very complicated ceiling, and uh, the depiction of the golden dragon in the middle of the cupola is again um, only allowed for kind of imperial architecture. So Yongluo Gong is a imperial, uh, even though it is a Taoist temple, it is sp uh, sponsored by um, the imperial court. It was sanctioned, you know, by the Mongol rulers. <clears throat> so as I mentioned before, the Mongols were quite open and tolerant in terms of religious practice, they sponsor all kind of um, religion. Yongle Gong um, is especially famous for its beautiful wall painting. So all the walls for all three major halls are covered by <coughs> painting of Taoist um, ceremonies and the Taoist stories. Um, so these were also um, you know, following the Buddhist example, um, having kind of didactic uh, function for those, uh, for the artistic decoration of their interior, uh, teach a story about Taoism, and then the large wall were also embellished with those um, Taoist deities, um, quite beautiful um, images and uh, <coughs> Although this is not an art history uh, class, I, I, you know, I do want to show you some of these images. So these were kind of 700 year old painting and uh, preserved on the wall. Um, <coughs> yeah, the, the, um, the right uh, image on the right was from the Hall of Three Purity and then the image on the on the left uh, was from the uh, the Chenyang Chenyang Dian, uh, the founders hall that uh, features the story of the um, eight immortals, uh, including the the founder of this specific school of Taoism. That guy in the white robe um, was the founder, <coughs> by the way. So um, now, now let's take a look at a um, different religion um, sponsored, you know, by the Yuan court during in the uh, 13th to 14th century. So this is the Guangsheng Si, the Guangsheng Monastery, and I wanted to use this example to. Um, <coughs> demonstrate the kind of the mixture of religion during the Yuan dynasty. So not only different religions were um, sponsored, but also, you know, they were constructed next to one another. And uh, thus could be interpreted as belonging to one, um, you know, religious complex. 
So here on the right is the Buddhist temple of the Guangsheng Si, Guangsheng Monastery. Um, but on the left is a temple dedicated to the Chinese god of war. Um, so that is kind of more like belonging to the Taoist um, tradition. So two buildings, one is Buddhist, another is Taoist, and the, um, you know, stand side by side um, with, with each other. And they were pretty much visited and worshipped by the same group of people. Um, so it testifies the mixture of religion and um, um, architectural style as well. So we will look at later um, that different local um, traditions in architectural construction were also mixed. So here we have the we have the plan, the Buddhist part, and uh, the Taoist part. Um, so it's located in the Hongdong uh, County in, in Shanxi province. And both of them, of course, follow the Chinese courtyard tradition. Um, the Buddhist temple has a series of, of gates, right? So they're from a gate, and um, um, then the the front hall for protectors, and then the back hall for um, for Buddhas, right? So um, obviously, this is kind of different, quite different from the previous Taoist temple. In this case, you know, the most the the building dedicated to the most important gods. Um, to Buddha is located in the back rather than in the center of the courtyard. <coughs> While the Taoist part, um, you know, follow more that it's kind of similar to the Yongle Gong. While we have the courtyard, um, the building, the main, main building, and in this case it's just one, is located in the center um, of the courtyard. Um, although it is not exactly located in the center, but if you draw a cross for this courtyard, you find that the beginning of that hall, the entrance, um, you know, the, the southern edge of the platform on which that hall is located, it's located, it's in the center. Um, so it's kind of more centrally located. And then, um, you know, a series of gate. Um, there's a front gate, there's a middle gate, and then surrounding rooms. So two building complex, a Buddhist and a Taoist uh, standing next to each other. I think that is the, uh, the main um, aspect I, I would like to, um, to highlight here. The rest of them, I'm going to just, um, um, show you more briefly. So this is the, uh, the gate to the Buddhist, um, the Buddhist half, um, elevated on high platform accessed by a central, um, accessed through a central ramp. And you, you guys should be able to, you know, see the kind of the Northern features of this uh, architectural tradition. And uh, <clears throat> and this is the um, the back hall, the the major Buddha hall uh, from the 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 Yuan Dynasty, and there was a upper temple for Guangsheng Si uh, located on the hill, um, so this part is also known as the lower temple of the Guangsheng Si uh, monastery. So this is a Yuan Dynasty building constructed in the Yuan Dynasty. Um, it is not a high-ranking building. <coughs> um, yeah. uh, 
because it it does not have an elaborate roof. Its its roof style um, is is low. It has a um, a gabled roof um, without hip hips. Uh, <clears throat> and um, here, you know, we are looking at the um, the Buddhist section from the Taoist part, right? So this is the Taoist courtyard, the Taoist temple, also elevated on a high platform, and uh, that is the uh, the Buddhist section uh, in the distance, and uh, the pagoda um, is the location of the upper temple. Right, so there was also a, a upper temple, but today the upper temple, um, the only uh, thing from the upper temple was survived um, is the, uh, the pagoda. So that the temple uh, was destroyed uh, later. Now let's take a look at the, uh, <coughs> the main hall of the Guangsheng Si lower, lower temple. Um, it was a low-ranking building. It has a gabled roof. Um, so gabled roof is lower than hip and gable, uh, which is lower than the pure hip roof. Right. So this is a low-ranking building. However, this building um, kind of um, is significant because of its it, it because of its plan. Um, if you look at the um, the column, the location of the column, right? So here, these are the column. The skeleton of the um, of the architectural carpentry. You notice the columns. In the surrounding wall, is not aligned with the interior columns. Right, this is the column, the interior column. So obviously, they they are not aligned with the column. So you draw a grid. Right, and these columns are off that grid. The other direction, the line up, right? the other direction is okay. But along this direction, they do not, <coughs> they do not line up exactly. Right? Um, the central bay does, you know, the central bay, they are still, you know, pretty they are still together uh, on the same line. But <coughs> the side column does not follow that. So this is called the shifting column method, which refer to this phenomena. It seems a kind of a minor thing, but in, in terms of the um, architectural carpentry, it created um, a, a complicated um, situation for the roof structure, right? Because that means, you know, the, um, the beam, the beam on top of, um, the beam needs to be uh, supported by um, another beam on the um, at the end instead of directly located on top of the of a column so which um, require more um, kind of a more sophisticated calculation um, <clears throat> but the benefit is obvious it reduced the number of interior columns. Otherwise, you know, you would have a column here and another column here. If you follow the grid of the um, surrounding walls, right? 
So the shifting of column method allowed the reduction of interior columns to create a more spacious interior space. Uh, and the purpose here, of course, was to kind of uh, uh, enlarge the side to base so that both the Buddha and, uh, and the standing Bodhisattva can be within, can be kind of uh, situated in between the two columns, right? So that's the benefit. <clears throat> um, and this kind of a structural innovation was made in the Yuan Dynasty, uh, probably because of the kind of a mixture of culture and um, the influence brought by the Mongols from other architectural tradition. We know that in the in the Yuan Dynasty, uh, different people were mixed were mixed up. People from outside China, from other part of China, were brought to to China and to different uh, different location. So that might contributed to such um, structural innovation, uh, not exactly following the previous convention of the column column grids, um, because you know that. The interior that is quite unconventional, because traditionally the central bay should be the widest, and indeed it still is on the facade. On the facade, you still you can still see um, the central bay is the widest, and it is a seven bay uh, facade. But the interior, it 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 became a five bay interior. And the central bay is the narrowest, um, the smallest. The two side bays was was wider than that. Uh, so in terms of interior experience, it is also quite unconventional, right? So this section shows that clearly. This is the interior. The interior experience is a five bay structure. But the location <coughs> of the brackets, you know, here shows you the, a seven bay structure. So that is following the the um, peripheral column. Okay. So the in another word, the roof and uh, structure underneath was. Um, using different uh, different system and uh, <clears throat> so such a kind of a shifting column method um, and of course by shifting then the number of columns was reduced so it's also sub kind of subtracting subtracting column so this is also because some columns are are um, deleted are subtracted um, <clears throat> was um, was okay and and was actually it was it was good uh, partially because here in this building <clears throat> the structure not only made innovation but also made the wall kind of more load bearing. So and in this case, this is not very um, conventional Chinese. So the wall um, actually was able to uh, bear some load of that beam, which, which, which you know carry uh, of of those beams um, that carry the weight um, of the superstructure. That allowed some flexibility for the shifting of those columns because the, of these kind of heavy masonry wall. 
And ideas like that might also have something to do with the mixture of culture uh, in the Yuan Dynasty. When a lot of craftsmen brought from Central Asia to China who um, were experienced um, with kind of masonry construction, and that might also contribute to such structural innovation. Uh, <clears throat> and the cupola is much more simplistic compared to the Taoist temple of Yongle Gong, um, because you know this is a lower ranking building, and the the decoration did not survive as good as well. Um, so <clears throat> the upper temple of Guangsheng Si Monastery. I mentioned that the Yuan Dynasty building had had not survived. The buildings survived were from the uh, later the Ming Dynasty. <clears throat> the only structure survived from Yuan was the pagoda, and um, other structures were from the Ming Ming Dynasty. So I'm just going to show you some of those other buildings from the the upper temple, and this is um, a Buddha hall. And I just want to draw your attention to um, you know the solidness and the uh, enclosed feature of this kind of a northern style. And in this case, <coughs> the um, the masonry feature of the building is also quite um, quite impressive. That somehow carried some weight. So in this case, the walls were not entirely uh, non-load bearing. Uh, <clears throat> now let's look at a totally different kind of tradition during the Yuan Dynasty. I mentioned that the Mongol rulers of the Yuan Dynasty favored especially Tibetan style um, of Buddhism. And uh, the founder of the Yuan Empire, Kublai, uh, Kublai Khan. He was um, a believer of Tibetan Buddhism, and he especially uh, <coughs> uh, favored uh, the Sakya branch of Tibetan Buddhism. You know, Tibetan Buddhism was also very kind of a complicated system. Under Tibetan Buddhism, there were Gluk tradition, there were Sakya tradition, and um, um, etc. and etc. So there were many different schools within Tibetan Buddhism, and uh, the Mongols um, of the Yuan Dynasty especially favored the Sakya order of Tibetan Buddhism. So this is the uh, Sakya Monastery, <coughs> which was constructed during the Yuan Dynasty. And it was also during the Yuan Dynasty uh, for the first time. China, Tibet, and Mongolia was under the same, you know, gov government in Beijing, um, and was within the same under for the first time under the same empire. Uh, before that, we know. During the Tang Dynasty, the Tibetan Empire was a competitor um, with the Tang Chinese emp Empire. But in the Yuan Dynasty, they were, you know, ruled by the same same ruler. So Sakya Monastery, which is in Tibet, was built in the Yuan Dynasty, and it is constructed kind of purely in the Tibetan style. There is no, you know. Um, visible uh, big roof. Um, it features those solid wall and uh, use textile to cover the entrance and use those horizontal decoration to create um, you know the, those surface division. And uh, on top of the flat roof, they use those gilded uh, metal decoration. Um, that also um, features kind of Buddhist motif like the wheel of Dharma and the um, the deers um, kind of worshiping um, the Dharma 
and those um, gilded bronze bronze decoration that symbolize um, a a Buddhist banner. Um, <clears throat> And another characteristic um, Tibetan feature of architecture is the letter shape on their facade. The, the trapezoidal um, decoration, their walls are um, tapering up, right? creating that kind of uh, trapezoidal shape. So are um, the, the frames for the window and the doors, right? so they have that Kind of a trapezoidal shape, uh, and they highlight that trapezoidal letter shape with heavy kind of black paint. So all those are very different from the uh, Chinese architecture we have been studying so far. So I'm introducing this not to um, as a formal introduction to dependent architecture, but to introduce this as a reference for the mixture of architectural tradition in the Yuan Dynasty. Now, another building constructed also in the Yuan Dynasty, also in Tibet, is called the, um, the Xialu Monastery, uh, the Xialu Monastery. Um, <clears throat> that is a Yuan Dynasty building from the early 14th century, um, from the area near uh, Shikaze uh, in Tibet. So this one um, features a mixture of Tibetan architecture and Chinese architecture. Right? So this is the, the main example I want to show. The previous one, I just wanted to familiarize you guys with Tibetan style uh, so that you can understand here we have a mixture of Tibetan lower part of the monastery and with the traditional Chinese roof superimposed. So it's a mi mixture of, of architectural style, the Chinese style and Tibetan style kind of combined in the, uh, in the same building. And um, the, um, the Shalu monastery also features courtyards. Um, and this is the, 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 the courtyard. Um, <clears throat> with a two-level corridors running around, you know, looks almost like a peristyle courtyard in the classical uh, tradition, architectural tradition. And uh, the main building features the Tibetan style that has the letter shape, uh, solid load-bearing wall, and uh, using textile to cover the entrance, but uh, you know, capped with a, in this case, a hip and gable roof, using brackets, using bright kind of um, uh, carpentry painting, and uh, <clears throat> kind of a gradually this kind of mixture became more and more is is established. And uh, today it is, this is kind of like the uh, national style of Mongolian architecture um, in the Mongolian Republic. But it started um, by, with the combination of two architectural traditions, the Tibetan and the Chinese, uh, since the, um, the Yuan Dynasty. Now, while in Tibet, Tibetan architecture was kept with traditional Chinese roof. In Beijing, a traditional Chinese Buddhist monastery was graced by a Tibetan style pagoda. Okay, so this is um, a monastery in, in Beijing, which was built during the Yuan Dynasty. During the Yuan Dynasty, Beijing is known as Dadu, the great capital. And this uh, monastery called the Miao Ying Si, uh, the Miao Ying Si monastery, features typical Chinese courtyard with sloping roofs, solid walls as appropriate for the northern style, and it features 
strong axiality. So you can observe all those characteristics, characteristics of traditional Chinese Buddhist architecture. But at the end of the axis is a Tibetan style pagoda called the White Pagoda. And it is not a, not a Chinese style pagoda at all. Um, it is a Tibetan style. It is closer to the Indian stupa in its solidness, in its lack of interior space, but featuring a tomb-like um, solid mound and uh, then an axis that represent the, uh, the axis of the universe. And the plan um, also remind us the uh, Buddhist mandala, um, like the Indonesian uh, Borobudur, which has this kind of zigzag uh, shape, um, but uh, um, vertically the, the pagoda can be, can be divided um, kind of into um, three uh, groups of layers representing the Buddhist cosmology of the three realms vertically connected by the central axis. So um, it's a Tibetan style, all right? Tibetan style um, building added to a Chinese style monastery. Um, so that mixture was made both in Tibet and in, uh, as well as in China proper. So a very beautiful um, pagoda, this white pagoda of Miao Ying's monastery was actually designed by um, a Nepalese, um, a, an architect from today's Nepal. Um, so he was, Nepal was also conquered by the Mongols and it became a vassal states, uh, one of the many vassal states, uh, you know, including Nepal, including Korea, Vietnam, so those were all kind of vassal states for the um, the Yuan um, Empire. So a, Nepal a Nepalese was brought to Beijing to design this Tibetan style um, architecture in a you know Chinese style Buddhist monastery. Um, <clears throat> the tripartite um, division of the White Pagoda, a lower platform, square uh, in shape, and the middle circular mound, and the top kind of a conical um, upper part, and then the axis with a big um, umbrella. <clears throat> and the, um, the whole building also contrasting the Chinese timber building which is colorful and painted bright. So here it's um, a pure kind of white color, but it's looming above those Chinese roofs, um, making a unmistakable announcement about a kind of a Tibetan uh, presence in the Chinese cap in the you know you know in the Yuan capital. Um, so this is another building. Um, this one. Uh, today is called the Juyong Pass. It controlled, um, it was located on the Great Wall, you know, very close to the Great Wall. So basically it is located at the border of the nom nomadic and the settled uh, part of the Yuan Empire. So to its north is the nomadic realm, to its south was the settled life of the farmers. So the Juyong Pass was a major mountain pass along the line of the Great Wall. Um, it's a very strategic location to the north of Beijing. So today, you know, it, it looks just like a pass, but if you stand underneath, you would see the, um, under this arch, um, a Buddhist, Tibetan Buddhist, uh, deities were carved uh, all over the surface, as well as inscriptions of many different languages, including Chinese, including Tibetan, um, but also include the, um, those dead language of 
that belong to the Xixia or the and the Jurchen of previous dynasties, um, and uh, Mongolian as well. Um, so it was there were inscriptions from many different languages of, of many different languages, and it features Tibetan Buddhist uh, subjects in the decoration. And uh, originally, it was like that. Um, so originally, that so-called Juyong Pass was actually in the form of a Buddhist pagoda. And that Buddhist pagoda was a Tibetan Buddhist pagoda. So um, it has one big pagoda located in the center and a two smaller one on the side. And this pass served as the platform for those Tibetan pagodas. Right? So this is in the location north of Beijing. And uh, north of Beijing, there were also kind of Tibetan style Buddhist architecture constructed during the Yuan Dynasty. So today, those pagodas had been destroyed, and all we have are is just a, you know this platform, uh, and it became known simply as a pass. But originally, it was a pagoda. Um, now let's take a look at um, some Buddhist structure constructed in the Mongolian area during the Yuan Dynasty. And uh, this is a Buddhist monastery known as the Xili Tu Zhao uh, or the, the Xili Tu Monastery. Um, and it is in the city of Hu Huhat um, in today's Inner Mongolia. And um, the original structure from the Yuan Dynasty had been replaced um, during the Ming and the Qing dynasty. So today, in terms of physical structure, it was mainly from the from after the 14th century. However, it represents a style that was initiated in the Yuan dynasty. Um, that is the combination of Chinese and Tibetan architecture into a Sino-Tibetan style. And Tibetan Buddhism is also known as Lamaism. So this architecture was sometimes also referred to as Lamaist um, architecture, the so Lama temple. So these Sino-Tibetan style Lama temple, the um, a consistent feature is the combination of Chinese and Tibetan style, of course. So its Chinese feature include axiality symmetry and the use of courtyard as well as the um, use of sloping roof on the top the tibetan features are primarily focused on the lower part of the building that is the uh, load bearing walls in combination with the timber frame and also the uh, the facade decoration featuring those trapezoidal motif as well as you know traditional Tibetan architectural motifs. So this building, this is the section <coughs> and uh, Tibetan Buddhism also require large interior space. So the solution it's something really familiar. Um, so in this section, you should be able to notice that it is a, some kind of a square shaped plan, but made up of three rectangular hall. And that is that building. That main building is a square plan, but in reality, it was it was a um, combination of three rectangular hall, 
And we have seen this before, right? Uh, in the Islamic architecture, used exactly the same, same combination to create interior space that for Muslim prayer. So here it's the same kind of method adopted to create um, a Sino-Tibetan style architecture, you know, featuring those traditional Chinese roofs on the top. So this is what, what it looked like from the main facade. And you can see um, kind of a Tibetan features of those horizontal um, division and the trapezoidal uh, motif, but it is combined with um, kind of colorful um, timber frame paint as well as sloping roof. Because of the high stair, high platform, the main roof is not visible, but you can see the rooftop decoration that is on top of a, uh, a sloping roof. Uh, that is what you are looking at, right? It has a sloping roof, uh, even though not, not very visible from the ground. Um, but it has, you know, from some angle, you would be able to see those sloping roof. And the interior uh, features Tibetan style, and it it has many columns, and um, but it is um, a square uh, in square shaped interior uh, made up of kind of three uh, rectangular halls. <clears throat> 